Welcome back. Welcome back. Welcome back, everybody, to another chapter of A Court of Mist and Fury, written by Sarah J. Moss, read by yours truly, Free Wada, with the exclamation point for the added emphasis. Today we are back <clears throat> from the last. Oh, man. We're on our last day of work, actually, by the way, in the morning before we go on Easter uh, vacation. So good Friday being tomorrow. So excited to have that off. But back to the story. Uh, I guess we are going to get that first piece, you know, our, our first piece to three, something like that, you know? I guess Fyra and Ryzen are uh, potentially becoming an item now. It was very, very quick. I knew they kind of like were off and on about like how they liked each other or not, but I thought it was more friendly. But uh, from this last chapter, it definitely proved otherwise. Other, other, okay. But let's get into chapter 20. Ryzen winnowed us into a wood that was older, more aware than any place I'd been. The gnarled beech trees were tightly woven together, splattered and draped so thoroughly with moss and lichen that it was nearly impossible to see the bark beneath. Where are we? Breathed, hardly daring to whisper. Rice kept his hands within casual reach of his weapons. In the heart of Prithian, there is a large, empty territory that divides the north and south. At the center of it, our sacred mountain. My heart stumbled, and I focused on my steps through the ferns and moss and roots. This forest, Rise went on, is on the eastern edge of that neutral territory. Here, there is no high lord. Here, the law is made by who is strongest, meanest, most cunning. And the weaver of the wood is at the top of their food chain. The trees groaned. Though there was no breeze to shift them, no, no, uh, oh, 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 no, comma, the air here was tight and stale. And Marantha didn't wipe them out? And Marantha was no fool, Rice said, his face dark. She did not touch these creatures or disturb the wood. For years, I tried to find ways to manipulate her to make that foolish mistake, but she never bought it. And now we're disturbing her for a mere test. He chuckled. The sound bouncing off the gray stone strewn across the forest floor like scattered marbles. Cassian tried to convince me last night not to take you. I thought he might even punch me. Why? I barely knew him. Who knows? With Cassian, he's probably more interested in fucking you than protecting you. You're a pig. You could, you know, Rise said, holding up the branch of a scrawny beach for me to slip under. If you needed to move on in a physical sense, I'm sure Cassian would be more than happy to oblige. It felt like a test in itself, and it pissed me off enough that I crooned. Then I'll tell him to come to my room tonight. If you survive this test. I paused atop a little lichen-crusted rock. You seem pleased by the idea that I won't. Quite the opposite, Fyra. He prowled to where I stood on the stone. I was almost eye-level with him. The forest went even quieter, the trees seeming to lean closer, as if to catch every word. I'll let Cassian know you're open to his advances. Good, I said. A bit of hollowed out air pushed against me, like a flicker of night. That power along my bones and blood stirred an answer. I made to jump off the stone, but he gripped my chin, the movement too fast to detect. His words were a lethal caress as he said, Did you enjoy the sight of me kneeling before you? I knew he could hear my heart as it ratcheted into a thunderous beat. I gave him a hateful little smirk anyway, yanking my chin out of his touch and leaping off the stone. I might have aimed for his feet, and he might have shifted out of the way just enough to avoid it. Isn't that all you males are good for anyway? But the words were tight, near breathless. His answering smile evoked silken sheets and jasmine-scented breezes at midnight. A dangerous line, one rise, was forcing me to walk to keep me from thinking about what I was about to face, about what a wreck I was inside. Anger. This 
flirtation, annoyance. He knew those were my crushes. What I was about to encounter, then, must be truly harrowing if he wanted me to go in there mad, thinking about sex, about anything but the weaver of the wood. Ha ha ha. The weaver of the wood thinking about sex, lol. Nice try, I said hoarsely. Ryzen just shrugged and swaggered off into the trees ahead. Bastard. Yes, it had been to distract me. But I stormed after him silently as I could, intent on tackling him and slamming my fist into his spine. But he held up a hand as he stopped before clearing. A small, whitewashed cottage with a thatched roof and half-crumbling chimney sat in the center. Ordinary, almost mortal. There was even a well, its bucket perched on the stone lip, and a wood pile beneath one of the round windows of the cottage. No sound or light within, not even smoke puffed from the chimney. The few birds in the forest fell quiet, not entirely, but to keep their chatter to a minimum. And there, faint, coming from inside the cottage, was a pretty, steady humming. It might have been the sort of place I would have stopped if I were thirsty or hungry or in need of shelter for the night. Maybe that was the trap. The trees were on the clearing, so close that their branches nearly clawed at the thatched root. Might very well have been the bars of a cage. Ryzen climbed his head toward the cottage, bowing with dramatic grace. In, out, don't make a sound. Find whatever object it was, snatch it from beneath a blind person's nose. Run like hell. Mossy Earth paved the way to the front door, already cracked slightly. A bit of cheese. That was the foolish mouse about to fall for it. Eyes twinkling, rise mouth. Good luck. I gave him a vulgar gesture and slowly, silently made my way toward the front door. The woods seemed to monitor each of my steps. When I glanced behind, Rise was gone. He hadn't said if he'd interfere if I were in mortal peril. I probably should have asked. I avoided any leaves and stones, falling into a pattern of movement that some part of my body, some part that was not born of the High Lords remembered. Like waking up. That's what it felt like. I passed the well. Not a speck of dirt, not a stone out of place, a perfect, pretty trap. The mortal part of me warned. A trap designed from a time when humans were prey, now laid for a smarter, immortal sort of game. I was not prey any longer. I decided as I eased up to that door, that I was not a mouse. I was a wolf. I listened on the threshold. The rock worn as if many, many boots had passed through and perhaps never passed over again. The words of her song became clear now, her voice sweet and beautiful like sunlight on a stream. There were two sisters that went playing to see their father's ship come sailing and when they came to the sea brim the elder did push the younger in. A honeyed voice for an ancient, horrible song. I'd heard it before, slightly different, but sung by humans who had no idea that it had come from fairy throats. I listened for another moment, trying to hear anyone else, but there was only a clatter and thrum of some sort of device in the weaver's song. Sometimes she sank, sometimes she swam, till her corpse came to the miller's dam. My breath was tied to my chest, but I kept it even, directing it through my mouth in silent breaths. I eased open the front door just an inch. No squeak, no whine of rusty hinges, another piece of the pretty trap, practically inviting thieves in. I peered inside when the door had opened wide enough. A large main room with a small shut door in the back. Floor-to-ceiling shelves lined the walls, crammed with the bric-a-brac of books. Shells, dolls, herbs, pottery, shoes, crystals, books, jewels. From the ceiling, 
and wood rafters hung all manner of chains, dead birds, dresses, ribbons, bits of wood, strands of pearl. A junk shop of some immortal hoarder. And that hoarder, in the gloom of the cottage, there sat a large spinning wheel, cracked and dulled with age. And before that ancient spinning wheel, her back to me sat the weaver. Her thick hair was of richest onyx, tumbling down to her slender waist as she worked the wheel, snow-white hands feeding and pulling the thread around a thorn-sharp spindle. She looked young, her gray gown simple but elegant, sparkling faintly in the dim forest light through the windows as she sang in a voice of glittering gold. But what did he do with her breastbone? He made him a veal to play on. What did he do with her fingers so small? He made pegs to his veal withal. The fiber she fed into the wheel was white, soft, like wool. But I knew, in that lingering human part of me, it was not wool. I knew what I did not want to learn, what creature it had come from, who she was spinning into thread, because on the shelf directly behind her were cones upon cones of threads of every color and texture, and on the shelf adjacent to her were swaths and yards of that woven thread, woven, I realized, on the massive loom nearly hidden in the darkness near the hearth, the weaver's loom. I had come on spinning day. Would she have been singing if I had come on weaving day instead? From the strange fear-drenched scent that came from those bolts of fabric? I already knew the answer. A wolf! Was a wolf! Stepped into the cottage, careful of the scattered debris on the earthen floor. She kept working, the wheel clattering so merrily, so at odds with her horrible song. And what did he do with her nose ridge? Unto his viol he made a bridge. What did he do with a vein so blue? He made strings to his viol there too. I scanned the room, trying not to listen to the lyrics. Nothing. Felt nothing that might pull me toward one object in particular. Perhaps it would be a blessing if I were indeed not the one to track the book. If today was not the start of what was sure to be a slew of miseries, the weaver perched there, working. I scanned the shelves, the ceiling, borrowed time. I was on borrowed time and I was almost out of it. Had Rice sent me on a fool's errand? Maybe there was nothing here. Maybe this object had been taken. It would be just like him to do that, to tease me in the woods, to see what th sort of things make my, uh, might make my body react. And maybe I resented Tamlin enough in that moment to enjoy that deadly bit of flirtation. Maybe I was as much a monster as the female spinning before me. But if I was a monster, then I supposed Rise was as well. Rise and I were one in the same. Beyond the power that he'd given me, it'd be fitting if Tamlin hated me too once he realized I'd truly left. I felt it. Then, like a tap on my shoulder, pivoted keeping one eye on the weaver and the other on the room as I wove through the maze of tables and junk. Like a beacon, a bit of light laced with its half-smile tugged on me. Hello, it seemed to say. Have you come to claim me at last? Yes. Yes, I wanted to say. Even as part of me wished it were otherwise. The weaver sang behind me. What did he do with her eyes so bright? On his viol he set at first light. What did he do with her tongue so rough? T'was the new till then it spoke enough. I followed that pulse. Toward the shelf lining the wall beside the hearth. Nothing. And nothing on the second. But the third. Right above my eye line. There. I could almost smell his salt and citrus scent. The bone carver had been correct. I rose on my toes to examine the shelf, an old letter knife, books in the leather that I did not want to touch or smell, a handful of acorns, a tarnished crown of ruby and jasper, and a ring. 
a ring of twisted strands of gold and silver, flecked with pearl and set with a stone of deepest solace blue. Sapphire. A different? I'd never seen a sapphire like that, even at my father's offices. This one. I could have sworn that in the pale light, the lines of a six-pointed star radiated around the across the round, opaque surface. Rise. This had rise written all over it. He sent me here for a ring? The weaver sang, Then bespake the treble string, Oh, yonder is my father king. I watched her for another heartbeat, gauging the distance between the shelf and the open door. Grabbed the ring and I could be gone in a heartbeat. Quick, quiet, quick, quiet, calm. Then bespoke the second string. Oh, yonder sits my mother queen. I dropped a hand toward one of the knives strapped to my thighs. When I got back to rise, maybe I'd stab him in the gut. That fast, the memory of phantom blood covered my hands. I knew how it'd feel to slide my dagger through his skin and bones and flesh. Knew how the blood would dribble out. Knew how he'd groan in pain. I shut out the thought. Even as I could feel the blood of those fairies soaking that human part of me, that hadn't died and belonged to no one but my miserable self. Then bespake the strings all three. Yonder is my sister that drowned me. My hand was quiet as a final dying breath as I plucked the ring from the shelf. The weaver stopped singing. And that was the end of chapter 20. Ooh! Oh my gosh, as a full... So, to start with the full recap, not even the full recap, just my personal thoughts, holy crap. This this weaver is kind of scary. If someone's singing and base if someone's singing while they're weaving basically the flesh of all their trapped enemies that they had, <laughs> just I'm just like, what the heck can she actually do, you know? That means she's ready to I, I don't know if that means she's like a play with her meal first or just kill them and then not worry about it kind of kind of weaver, you know what I'm saying? Um, I did see, I, I don't know if Sarah caught this or maybe, maybe it was just well-timed with what it was saying in the book, because I felt like in between each of those little, uh, licks that we got of the Weaver song, that there was definitely more rhyming within the actual text after. So I don't know if Sarah was like, oh, I'm in the rhyming mood today, you know, <laughs> and maybe didn't realize it or if she was like, I'll just, you know, these words rhyme and whatever, we'll put it in here like it is. I'm sure you have to go through editing hell anyway, so, like, I'm sure what she maybe wrote there first got, like, changed up a bunch, at least in a sense of, like, the same stuff's going on, but just a different way to phrase it. So, you know, that's, I, I, I just thought that was funny, though. But with that, we will be back with the next chapter. Uh, I think this one's coming out today on Thursday because I didn't have any other stuff pre-recorded. Uh, but hopefully tomorrow... I'll start recording a bunch so that that way next week we can maybe have an episode each day. And maybe if we have a bunch, we could throw out a couple chapters at once. We'll see. We'll see how far I want to end up reading on a Friday. But y'all, make sure to stay beautiful, stay hydrated, and we'll see you in the next chapter. Bye.